you should let the children decide what they want to do can you sing something for us mm-hmm. <laughs> not here not here <laughs> the work should be what you love to do and if it is what you love to do then why is there a work life balance i would have loved to meet steve jobs i actually traveled to the us to meet uh, with apple uh, people then and i could not meet steve jobs because he had to used to me narayan murthy was also around there so you know uh, narayan murthy of course i know him from day one so he uh, he he came to buy computers from us when he was starting uh, at the same time many entrepreneurs complain about tax policies in india that uh, indian uh, policies do not favor startups indian tax policies you are 100% right the next wars will be fought with semiconductors and we have uh, an outstanding minister like ashwini vaishnav he comes from a technology background and a business background and he was an entrepreneur himself hello everyone uh, welcome back to another episode of chilmizaz and today we have one of the founding members of hcl uh, shri ajay choudhary sir uh, sir bahut bahut swagat hai Thank welcome you. to our show ji uh, so sir uh, before coming to here i was uh, googling you and uh, on your wikipedia page i found that your family uh, has moved from pakistan to india at the time of partition so uh, you were not even born at that time so can you please uh, share the story with us well basically my father was a lawyer in abbottabad okay. and uh, my we had a very large family uh, five sisters and one brother and i brought i was born in india okay. so they all came on pretty much the last train out of pakistan and they had a very terrible journey because the whole family got divided into two three compartments and uh, my grandmother died on the way so they had a very terrible time and they had to basically uh, you know get off at one particular location in punjab and from there uh, they buried my uh, they did the rites for my grandmother and then they all moved to delhi and uh, in delhi they uh, just like what happened in <clears throat> during the partition people who went from india to pakistan got somebody who had left their home and same thing happened to them when they came here uh, they were given a uh, home of a of a muslim who had gone to pakistan and uh, it was a terrible place it was like a, a coal warehouse in a manner he was a coal merchant so they had to really clean up the place and some of lived there for a, for a period of time till the refugee camp got ready and then they went moved to the main refugee camp in delhi so that's how their uh, sort of uh, story started and my father then became the uh uh manager of the camp and uh, <clears throat> then over the next few weeks or months uh after he had started that uh, somebody whom he knew came visiting and he just came there to see the camp and he saw my father and he said uh, what are you doing here so he said uh, this is what i'm doing so he said this is not what you should be doing and so he Uh, said that okay uh, i'll let you know in a few weeks so then after a few weeks he came back and said i have got a job for you you go to mount abu uh, in rajasthan and your job is to work with the team that is working with sardar patel on integrating all the maharajas into the indian union so that became his job so that's how it all started and then since we were in mount abu i was born there Okay, so your family had a very tough time uh, back then in nineteen fifties. Mm-hmm. So, sir, uh, how hard how hard it was that your father left everything uh, left everything behind in Pakistan, then starting from uh, beginning at mm-hmm. in India. So, yeah, it was starting from scratch really because there was nothing they could bring with them except that the clothes that they were wearing and a few little belongings. And uh, anyway, Mount Abu was a fantastic change from that horrible uh, coal uh, coal house. and uh, it was a home that was actually of the old british resident so literally everything was provided for so it's a it's like 0 to 100 and um, then my father got very busy uh, getting uh, his job done and then he decided to appear for uh, the ias in 1955 and then he passed through the ias and became an ias officer for mp 
your father has changed his profession from lawyer to IAS. Is it in your genetics that uh, starting from uh, beginning that you also created HCL? So your father also uh, created everything from the scratch. So how HCL happened? Well, basically, uh, then after moving from, uh, you know, many, many cities, because if in IAS, you have to move from one city to another city. And after moving from many cities, we landed up at Jabalpur, <coughs> which is a small town in MP. And uh, I started my life there. I, I was still then studying in a Hindi medium school and I had to move to an English medium school. So my father got a English teacher for me and it was a fast track learning of English in three months. And I joined the English school, which is called Christ Church School in Jabalpur. And then uh, uh, I did my engineering from there also uh, because my father was getting old and I had to be there. I can't just go away to a hostel and be away. So I was the only youngest person. All, all others had flown uh, the coop in a manner. So everybody was married and everybody was all over the place. So uh, I stayed and did my engineering in Jabalpur Engineering College, which is one of the oldest colleges in the country. Uh, and uh, I did telecommunication and then uh, last uh, one year, they also added electronics to it. So electronics and telecom is what I passed out with. And uh, during this period, I was very influenced by my brother who was uh, into sales and marketing. He was, a, he was a very, uh, he was in Caltech at one time, then he joined ITC. So he was very much into sales and marketing and he felt that uh, that's a damn good career to be in. So he started giving me books to read and I was quite influenced. So at the end of my engineering course, I said, uh, if I can use my engineering to sell and market, I think that will be a better direction for me. And that's how I sort of started applying for jobs and jobs were not there at that time. So it's a very tough time because it took me six months before I got, uh, you know, interview calls. And then I got three interview calls and I went to Delhi mm -hmm. for appearing for those interviews. And uh, it just so happens that I got all the three jobs. And uh, then I had to decide which job to take. And uh, I said, let me take DCM data products because that was in the electronics business. And that's what I had done. So I said, it makes sense for me to join. And that was a life changing decision for me because uh, six of us then left DCM in 1975 to start HCL. In 1975? 1975. So I worked in DCM for three years and then 75, six of us left. There was nothing called startups then. There was nothing called angels or VCs or nothing. No money was available. Nothing was available. So six of us put together whatever uh, we could gather from family, friends, this, that. You know, And the total amount we gathered was 1.86 lakhs. And the company really started with their 1.86 lakhs and today we are a $6 billion company globally. So, you know, uh, I've always maintained, and this is something that I learned from my guru, Dr. C.K. Prahlad later, that A is greater than R. If you have the aspiration, resources happen. So when we were starting out the uh, computer business, it was license Raj. So you needed a license to actually make a computer. Okay. So there was no way you could just, you know, on your own, the way today's startups start, you know, you just put together a product and start marketing. Nothing like that existed. So to make a computer, we needed a license and a small uh, startup like us, it was impossible to get a license. So we sort of uh, started a little marketing company to get some money because our money was very short. And uh, in the meantime, started thinking how to get a license. So we tried, knocked on many doors. And suddenly one day we discovered that UP government was sitting with a license. So we approached the UP government. And they had a UP electronics corporation called Uptron. And we met uh, Colonel Rai who was the chairman. And uh, we said that this is who we are. And we have done all this in, H in DCM. We'd like to you know, create our own company with your license and maybe we can form a joint venture. So that's what we did. We formed a joint sector company called Hindustan Computers Limited. And that's how HCL was born. And as I said, we had no resources, but everything happened. And uh, then because we were a joint sector company, banks also opened up their wallets and we started getting loans from the UP government itself. 
UP's uh, finance company gave us a loan. And that's how we got started. And uh, we designed our first uh, four, bit, uh, four bit desktop computer. Today we talk about quad core and phones. Yes, so uh, this four bit product was uh, you know, what we designed as our first uh, engineering scientific computer. And we beamed it at IITs and engineering institutions and research institutions. But the product was still getting ready and we didn't have the money to last. So we took a very strong decision that we start marketing before the product is ready. Now that's a very audacious call, but that's what HCL is famous for. And therefore we took that call and we gathered top salespeople whom we trained uh, to be great salespeople and gave them, the, gave them a beautiful brochure. And that's all we had. We didn't have a product. So with a brochure, they were asked to sell. And my co-founder, Arjun Malhotra, who was from IID Kharagpur, he said, I'll sell the first one. So he took that challenge. He went to IIT Kharagpur, went and met all his profs and convinced them and said, give me an order. And he got an order for a desktop computer. And then we went to all other IITs and we were replicated that order. Because now everybody felt that if IIT Kharagpur can buy, I can also buy. Okay. So talking about sales and marketing, uh, in today's time, we see everything is uh, digitalized and we have access to, so, uh, access to so many platforms, which was not the situation at that time. So how hard was selling at that time without access to these social platforms and uh, digital platforms? You see, uh, there's a difference between B2B, B2C and B2G. Okay. Business to business, you still have to sell through salespeople, majorly. B2C is where you use platforms. B2G, you still have to sell to KP sales people. So nothing has changed. So, but you have today the benefit of a phone. You have the benefit of email. You have the benefit of social media. So you can create a story much faster and better. Then there we had to use, those days there was no, no you know, laptop or anything. It all used to be flip card, flips. So you actually created something like a, a calendar and you flipped the flip chart to make a presentation. So it was a very different time. But I must tell you one thing that in terms of sale, selling to business and selling to government, pretty much the same skills are required. And therefore, when I meet startups, and I, they talk to me about how to create a company. Uh, the first thing I tell a CEO of a startup is that you better be a very good salesperson. Because I strongly believe that sales is at the heart of the business. You may have the greatest product in the world, but you can't sell it, it's no use. Right? So that's something that even I've, I've written a book recently called Just Aspire. And why did I call it Just Aspire? Because my Key thinking always has been that if you have the aspiration, you will succeed. And Please that's what happened to us. We didn't have any resources. We had only aspiration. So that's really what I tell all the startups today, that if you just have the aspiration and don't worry about resources, they will happen. And one of the things I always tell them about is salesmanship. So in my book, there is a chapter specifically for salesmanship. And there's a chapter on entrepreneurship. So all that I have learned on how to create companies, how to create businesses, how to manage people, how to uh, sell is there in my book in different chapters. So it's, the 50% of the book is about my HCL story and 50% of the book is all the learnings that I've had in my life. Okay, sir, in today's time, entrepreneurship is a trend. Even entrepreneurs are celebrated as a cel like celebrities, which was uh, not the case back in 1975. So what was your vision and mission of starting HCL? And uh, you wanted to make money or what was the uh, vision? You see, that time the microprocessor had just made its appearance. The first microprocessor had just been introduced. So in, my, in our thinking, we said, let's take the microprocessor and change the world. A small little company thinking like that those days is a very big thing. But that's really what got us going because it's that aspiration of wanting to change the world with the, with the technology that was available is what happened to us. And 
the very early days of our of our life in the in, in, in of HCL, IBM was asked to leave the country. When IBM left the country, they were selling very old computers here. They were selling refurbished computers. So that market got opened up, and uh, we had to occupy that market. When we started HCL, there were just hundred computers in the country. Hundred computers. Just hundred. That's hundred. And when we started HCL, we had to tell people why they should buy a computer. So we were actually creating a market, and that was a very tough sell. So let's say if you are in the north, it was a little easier. If you were in the west, it was easy. I wouldn't say easy, but better because west, like Bombay, is a very fast-moving environment, business environment where people understand the value of. Return on investment if they buy a computer. I was handling South. South is very conservative, so for them to you know embrace computers was a very tall task. But that's what we did early days. So the journey of an entrepreneur is not an easy journey. It's always been tough, and it remains to be tough. It's a very lonely game. The CEO is absolutely lonely person. So I always tell startups. Don't start a uh, company by not having additional founders. You must have at least two, three founders in a company because then you can easily talk to each other. Otherwise, you're absolutely lonely. All just one person. Who do you talk to? Who do you bounce your ideas? Who's whose shoulder are you going to cry if something does not happen? कुछ चाहिए है ना तो वो कैसे आएगा? So a lot of uh, startups, you know, think that. हम अकेले हम चला लेंगे नॉट द राइट थिंग टू डू एंड आई डोंट इन्वेस्ट इन अ सिंगल कंपनी दैट हैज अ सिंगल फाउंडर आई हैव इन्वेस्टेड इन सेवेंटी स्टार्टअप्स आई डोंट हैव एनी कंपनी व्हिच हैज अ सिंगल फाउंडर आई डोंट बिलीव इन इट सर व्हाट डू यू सी व्हेन यू इन्वेस्ट इन स्टार्टअप्स द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग टू मी इज द फाउंडिंग टीम आई लुक एट दोस पीपल एंड आई सी वेदर दे हैव द फायर इन द वैली because it's a very lonely journey and it's a very tough journey first 5 to 10 years are really really tough so i like to see whether they have the gumption to actually really see it through and do they have a very well knit team maybe somebody is uh, very strong technically somebody has some you know accounting finance background somebody has sales and marketing background these three things are very critical so if they don't have all the three I always advise them get up another founder who ha- who's who who ha- who has capability that you don't have. So this makes for a very good mix, and then of course the idea. You can't ignore the idea because if the idea itself is useless, then the best founding team cannot help. So in the studying, SL was about hardware, but then uh, later on you started selling services also in, in around the ninety one I guess. So Mr. Narayan Murthy was also around there. So you know uh, Narayan Murthy. Of course, I know him from day one. So he uh, he he came to buy computers from us when he was starting. Okay. So he was sitting in our uh, uh, reception in Bangalore, trying to meet our regional manager that we want to buy some computers. So it all you know he was much after us. We started in seventy six. They started in the eighties. And uh, Narayan Murthy, see, let let me tell you something very interesting, which most people don't know. Every large company of this country, majority, started from hardware. So, Mr. Narayan Murthy used to work in Patni, and Patni was a hardware company. Okay, TCS was started from Tata Burroughs. The first order that TCS got was from Burroughs. It was a hardware company. The same thing for Wipro. They started as a hardware company. So, HCL also started as a hardware company. But we got into software much later. Because suddenly, around nineteen ninety one, you see, those days, if you wanted to make computers, you had to import literally everything to put it all together: the microprocessor, the memories, the disk drives, everything. So we were totally import dependent. Nineteen ninety one, the there was a crisis in the country for foreign exchange. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was total crisis. There was only three days of foreign exchange left to run the country, so there was no way we could import anything. So company was pretty much going to die. We somehow managed it, 
by talking to friends abroad and oh, getting them to open LCs and sending us material and all that. But that's when we realized that it's important for us to diversify into software. So that's what we did. We started working on creating a software business. But much later than all of, all of these guys, all of them started much ahead of us. TCS was the first and then Infosys was the number two. Now, when we migrated into software, we clearly understood that uh, uh, we were very small and scale was very important for software. Because all of these guys were in 200 million, 300 million, 500 million and we were starting with 5 million. It's not going to work if you want to. We have, and in HCL, if we have the ambition, we want to do it better than everybody else. So we started that way. And then as we built the company, the first thing that we did was that what is our strength? And our strength was that in hardware, we, we could design things, we could write operating systems, we could write uh, applications around that operating system. So we said, why can't we use our R&D capability? And that's what we did first. We created a company called HCL Technologies. And we said, it will be a technology company which will use, which will actually export R&D software. And that's what we created. It's a completely new area that we created. And many others followed. But R&D exports today itself also remains a very large part of HCL. So that's what we did. And then we bought many companies. And we uh, sort of kept on adding to our software business. And uh, two years late, two years ago, we became the fourth largest. So, starting from pretty much zero, we've sort of crossed at least hundreds of software companies. We are now bigger than Wipro. Sir, first thing why I uh, why I talked about Mr. Narayan Murthy is because few months back he went viral that uh, he told uh, that employees should work seventy hours a week. So, what is your opinion regarding that? I totally agree with it. I'll tell you why I agree with it. You see, uh, the world has completely changed. We are 20, 30 years behind many countries. We are still in the middle income trap. And we continue the same way. We cannot be a developed country. So if we sit back and say, boss, we have achieved in life. It's, it's a misnomer completely. We are living in a fool's paradise. If we want to go fast, if we want to succeed against the Europeans or the Americans or the Chinese, we have to work harder. There's no option. And we have to work smarter. And we cannot grow linearly. We have to grow exponentially. Now, if you don't put in that extra effort, the Europeans work four days a week, five days a week. Masti karte hain. They assume, they, they assume that they have reached, they reached where they have they have reached. Everything is provided for for Europeans. The government provides you everything. Social security, this, that. So they are santushed. Humko santushed agar hum hoke bad gaye, hum aage nahi bada hai. So I agree with them totally. And I think the choi choice with us is that we just sit back and do nothing and be happy and run four days a week and have, you know, lots of youngsters come and ask me this question about work-life balance. And everybody is confused about it. I don't believe in work-life balance. I think what you should be doing is that your work should be what you love to do. And if it is what you love to do, then why is there a work-life balance? You love to have a home life, you love to have a work life. If you don't like the work life, don't do work. So what you love other than work? You watch movies? You see, that's a very interesting question that you asked me. You know, I am what I call myself is a rangist. So I have multiple interests in life. And I started developing those interests very early days. Like uh, uh, in, in, in pretty much the first year of my engineering, I was a space enthusiast. <laughs> I loved to read about space exploration. So I used, those days there was no internet, no TV. I used to write letters to NASA and say that uh, uh, I am a young engineer from India and I am very interested in what you guys are doing. Can you send me some pictures of your latest uh, 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 products that you are launching? So they used to send me 
posters and things like that and material to read. And my room was plastered with those pictures, like all four walls. And so I started like that. And then there was nothing to connect with the rest of the world those days because there was no internet. So I, I sort of uh, got into having pen friends all over the world. That way we could exchange what was happening in the rest of the world. Okay. So that was something that I did. Then I was a very avid uh, shortwave listener. There was no TV, there was no radio, there was no internet. How do you get information? How do you get to know about other countries? So I used to sit with my radio and uh, figure out which frequency is uh, this country, which frequency is this country, which frequency is this country. And I would tune in and listen. So I have a great belief that no engineer passing out of an IIT should just be a nerd. I don't want nerds coming out. I would like to see very well uh, rounded people coming out. So when I started, I mean, I started IIT Hyderabad from scratch with my with a director. And the first thing I told my director was that uh, uh, I don't want nerds coming out. So he created a very interesting model, which was called fractals. And what was fractals? Fractals was 30 little, little credit programs, one credit, two credit programs around astronomy, around drama, around music. And students had to choose four or five of those. That made them well rounded. And so that's really been my, you know, strategy from the beginning. I used to sing in school and college. Okay. After I passed out, after I uh, stopped uh, work, you know, I retired 10, 12 years ago and I started my second in innings. I, four, five years ago, I started learning how to sing and I have a teacher who come teaches me. So, you know, this is what I believe. You need to have all these interests outside of your absolute vertical. So it's like a T. On top of the T is this thing and this is where your various interests are and that length downwards is your focus area. So you should know literally everything about computing and that's what I do uh, and hardware. But on top is sitting a very interesting area which expands my mind. I think that's very essential. I said, who is your favorite singer? I sing everything. I sing old Bollywood songs. Okay, can you sing something for us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not here, not here. <laughs> uh, sir, um, uh, talking about scale that uh, how, uh, you uh, build everything from scratch and how uh, the scale that you have reached. Sir, in today's time, uh, we see another trend is that people are making companies and they are selling companies. So, what about this uh, this trend? That's a that's an interesting trend actually because uh, that's a way to make wealth, and there's nothing wrong. See, there was a time in India when, you know, you, we were a very socialist, communist type of country. Agar aap bhot paisa banate te, you were not a good person. I think all that has changed. If you make good money today and you're wealthy, you're respected. So what's wrong? I mean, you can have, you can create a company. If you don't think you can scale it yourself, you have two options. Number one, you merge with somebody or you sell that company off. Sir, one thing which I noticed is uh, outside India, we have many young billionaires, which is not the case in India. Because in India, we pursue entrepreneurship after a certain time that, okay, we should quit this and then we should pursue As you bol rahe aap. There are many billionaires who are already very young, 30s. Okay. There must be at least, I mean, if there are 100 unicorns in this country, just imagine how many of them are worth a billion. So, some of them... You know, although Baiju has not done well in the last 2-3 years, but they were valued at 23 billion. Who was Ravindran? Ravindran was a teacher. He became a billionaire. So, it's not that it's, that does not happen. It happens. It doesn't happen in the large numbers that America has, but we are not, uh, we are not that large. We don't have that history of startups. America has a very long history of startups. But don't forget that India has a history of entrepreneurship. Sir, uh, we, uh, we have been, uh, when we talked about aspirations, like uh, many students have idea in their mind. So when you have no resources, so how one can pursue entrepreneurship when you don't have any resources but you have idea in college? Today it's become so easy. In our time, it was not easy. 
अब तो आपके पास सब कुछ है टुडे लिटरली एवरी इंस्टीट्यूट हैज एन इंक्यूबेटर यू वॉक इन टू द इंक्यूबेटर विद द आइडिया दे गिव यू टेन लैक्स फिफ्टीन लैक्स ट्वेंटी लैक्स थर्टी लैक्स एंड यू कैन गेट योर आइडिया टू टू फोइश and from there you take off and then you get angel investing then you get vc investing and money is available money is no longer uh, issue as far as startups are concerned hamare time mein to money but it was a most important issue sir who is your favorite entrepreneur in today's generation and why you see i don't have a single uh, person who i sort of look up to that way but my my co-founder shivnar is an outstanding entrepreneur right? so i always looked up to him as a mentor but uh, uh, if i look around me i i you see i have always believed in this concept which is that if you stand on the shoulders of tall men you can see very far so i have had lot of discussions with people like bill gates like bill gates used to come to india every year and i used to meet him every year okay and i've even gone to his home in 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 in, in the us so i have met many entrepreneurs like that i would love to meet i would have loved to meet steve jobs i actually traveled to the us to meet uh, with apple uh, people then and i could not meet steve jobs because he had to used to me but i met met tim cook similarly i met steve barmer in microsoft terrific entrepreneur okay great marketing sales guy then i met uh, people like uh, uh i have met many people in the telecom industry and many people in the in the hardware industry top people i have met all the chair the earlier chairmen of hewlett packard i met all the chairmen of intel so there's been a lot of learning that i have got from these people so it's not that i have a single person like that but definitely i really look up to elon musk because i think the person has audacity is his second name so what he does others don't do sir you have met so many top uh, people on the top so what is the difference in attitude that they, they have uh, from a common people all of them had great aspirations it's what drove them okay uh, sir talking about your personal life uh, tell us about your family and uh, uh, how you spend time with them and about your kids well actually uh, from a from a long long time i have had this thing about Uh, creating some time for the family although i was creating the company so my time was very bad but a lot of times i used to spend pretty much the whole sunday with my children so they used to complain about uh, your time that you should spend more time with them i guess they understood they were saying that i was struggling see most of my life is that most of the life of a entrepreneur is struggle it's only uh, in in my time you made it actually at age 40 or 50 in today's time you can make it at age 30 or 40 very different uh, so sir uh, what are they doing uh, in their career professionally so uh, they did what they wanted to do. see one of the things that i i've always believed is that you should let the children decide what they want to do so i never told them do this or that none of them wanted to be in it none of them wanted to be in hardware or software Okay. So they were very clear about what they wanted to do. So my eldest son uh, 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 went to Stevens and did physics, and he pretty much topped the university. And then he went to Cambridge on a scholarship, and uh, he did uh, physics and uh, uh, psychology and uh, and uh, and management. Three. It was called Tripos. Three things that they do. And after Cambridge, he went and worked with Accenture for seven, eight years, and then he went to Harvard to do his MBA. And then he came back to Singapore and started to work as a uh, as part of the strategy team of the chairman of DBS Bank, who happens to be a very bright Indian, and he loved working with him, Piyush Gupta. And then uh, he decided one day to leave everything and said, "I don't want to work for anybody, and I want to do something which is different." So he started working with four or five startups, and he became an advisor to about four or five startups, and he invested in them and make made them grow, and he's had good returns from some of those. Three four years ago, he decided that uh, this is not exciting enough. I need to do something more exciting. So he started a little fund of his own just before COVID, and of unfortunately during COVID everything collapsed. 
So he lost all his money there. He is still trying to recover some money from there. But then, three, four years ago, he started to delve into crypto. So today, uh, he is a total crypto person. There is nothing he doesn't know about crypto. He knows the technology, he knows how it works, he knows how to invest, how to disinvest, everything. So four years ago, he started investing into crypto and he had fantastic returns. And then at the right time, he sold before crypto collapsed. And again now, six, eight months ago, he kept, he's been telling me, you watch what happens to crypto this year. And he started investing. And look at what's happened to Bitcoin. It's gone 300%. So he's freaking out. So his, he has great belief in crypto and he wants to continue that direction. So that's my eldest son. The three children that he has, they live in Singapore. My youngest son said from the beginning that I want to be a musician. <laughs> so he's a full-time musician. Full-time musician, Goa. okay. Lives in Goa. And he, he has two children. Okay, it was in genetics. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so, sir, uh, you uh, you talked about that uh, your son lost all the money uh, during COVID. So, sir, uh, what was the lowest moment in your life when something like that happened? Oh, there were many. There's not once. Many, many, many. Because the life of an entrepreneur is an up and down piece. There's nothing like uh, linear. Everything is up and down, up and down, up and down. Sir, so how do you deal uh, with lowest moments, with low moments? See, at that particular moment, you start to think it can't be better, worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll only get better. Sir, so what is your vision? Uh, what do you want to do now? See, for the last uh, 20, 30 years, 40 years, I've been pursuing this whole idea that India has to be very big in electronics and semiconductors. I have written many reports for the country. 40 years ago, I wrote a report saying that India must have at least two fabs. Only when COVID hit us, we realized that semiconductors are important. And there was this uh, person in American Senate who was the head of their uh, intelligence. And he said something very interesting four or five years ago. He said, the next wars will be fought with semiconductors. So for a long time, I've been telling the various governments that invest into semiconductors because, you know, a lot of global Indians said, no, 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 we are very good with design in India. We, are what, we can design chips. Why do we have to be in fabs? Look what happened during COVID. Every had, everybody had a shortage of semiconductors. And you know what's happening in America today? For 20 years, they've been dependent on China and Taiwan and other countries for semiconductors. They were doing design, but they were not making semiconductors. So, big, big uh, chip companies happened in America, but they don't make a single chip in America. All their chips are made in Taiwan. So, when they realized that, uh, at, during COVID that this is an absolute disaster, they just opened up the whole country for investments into startup, into, into semiconductors, big way. So they're just pouring money now because they have to catch up the 20 years that they've lost. So what is the current situation of India since you're also the, in the advisory board of uh, India's mission of semiconductors. So tell us about the current situation. Current situation is very good because uh, all the mistakes we made in the past of creating the uh, semiconductor manufacturing capability in India, the attempts were made, but nobody was picking, uh, wanting to come to India. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is that the investments in semiconductors are large. See, a typical fab will cost you uh, a high uh, a nanometer lab uh, you know, fab will cost you four to five billion. Four to five billion. Four to five billion. And if you are actually talking about three nanometers, which is what our phones use, this will cost you fifteen to twenty billion. So the investments are very very large. And it, when various governments in the past tried to do in, in invite people to come to invest, people were saying, "You don't have an ecosystem. Why do you want to come?" So. 
they came up with schemes they said we'll give you so much money we'll give you 20% of the capex we'll give you 30% of the capex no deal was interested this government was very bold what they said was that if you come to india we will we'll invest 50% and we will invest up front so when you put your check for 50% we will put a check for 50% this is a very bold decision this is something that only a person like modi will do because he's got that audacity to do things like this and so he did that and that actually changed the the, the way we work and we have a, an outstanding minister like ashwini vaishnav he comes from a technology background and a business background and he was an entrepreneur himself so you know he understands this and therefore he actually created this whole uh, thinking that we need to invest together so in the last two, two years uh, in the last uh, six months itself we've announced uh, uh, micron we've announced uh, uh, tatas we've announced uh, uh, cg and we have announced another tatas four plants we have announced okay all four plants will eat up all the 10 billion dollars we had decided to put 75000 crores was put aside 69000 has been spent in a manner committed not spent so uh, now uh, ashwini vaishnav is talking about the next phase he says we put another 10 billion dollars so hum aisa nahi hai ki isko yahi chhod denge we will we will continue to invest and we will continue a, a journey which they have charted for 25 years 20 years they have created a plan which uh, prime minister modi supports personally he says that look if we don't do a long term act on this we are not going to be successful okay. so i think that is where what i am i have great belief that we will be able to do things sir you are talking about semiconductors uh, semiconductors from a long time so what was the issue it was money or political decisions we were not we were not committed to doing things the way it should be done we always thought ke, let somebody come and invest 5 billion हम बाद में आपको एक बिलियन दे देंगे नो बडी वॉज बिलिंग अमेरिका यू गो टू थर्टी परसेंट अप फ्रंट देन वी डिसाइडेड इफ यू हैव टू बीट अमेरिका वी शुड बी फिफ्टी परसेंट अप फ्रंट कि सर यू टॉक अबाउट ऑडेसिटी ऑफ प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदी मेनी ऑफ आर इंजीनियर्स आर ऑल्सो कमिंग बैक टू इंडिया टू स्टार्ट देर ओन वेंचर्स बट एट द सेम टाइम मेनी अंटरप्रेन्योर्स कंप्लेन अबाउट टेक्स पॉलिसीज इन इंडिया दैट इंडियन पॉलिसीज डू नॉट वेर स्टार्टअप Indian tax policies. You are hundred percent right. This is something that we are all fighting for, and we have always been telling the government they must change their tax policies. So, for example, why do people join startups? They it's not for salary. They join for the adventure. They want to do something on their own. But when they get their employee stock option program, when they sell, when they get it, they have to pay tax. That's ridiculous. they should pay tax when uh, when it vests they have to pay tax they should pay tax when they sell it so this is a very big fight that we are doing with the government that change this policy because this is a very negative policy for startups i uh, said when can we expect some kind of change who knows i keep writing about it and as a matter of fact uh, i have just written an article yesterday which is going to be published next week on what's my prescription for startups and that's going to come out in uh, financial express so what are the qualities one must have to be an, an entrepreneur deal with the first thing you have to be clear about is that you have to deal with uncertainty there is nothing called black and white in entrepreneurship everything is gray you need to paint it black or white okay sir uh, on the ending note uh, i would love if you can share some of your uh, uh, advices from your uh, learning experiences from your life uh, for our audience so basically if your audience is mainly startups i would assume and students so i'm going to talk things. about my dream for india okay okay which i did in the lecture i delivered yesterday to the students also see it's there in my uh, last uh, chapter of my book also okay india now needs to move from being a services country to a product country why services has taken us to where we are today 
software services were created 35 40 years ago from 5 million we are 250 billion in software we occupy 30 percent of the world's software services business we've had phenomenal success which is what has created our a very large part of our foreign exchange requirement has come from here. But in addition to that, everything that you see, we are in services. We are in airlines services. We don't make aircraft. Who makes money? The guy who makes aircraft. Not the guy who supplies one services. Same thing is for diamonds. Diamond cutting, we are the largest in the world. Exactly, sir. We have best engineers. We have the best engineers in the world. Ah. Still, we are exporting many things from uh, foreign countries. That is the problem. We have great engineering and R&D capability. We have great scientists in this country. You know, inside the 250 billion of NASCOM numbers sits a hidden figure of 39 billion. This 39 billion is export of R&D from India. It's not software. It's R&D. And so, this R&D shows us 39 million. But actually, it's done by 150 global companies sitting here, exporting R&D uh, capability from here. So, actual number is not 39 billion. It's about 100 billion. Because the 39 billion is just a transfer price. They don't add profit here. The profit is all kept there. So, when you add the profit, uh, etc., it becomes 100 billion. So, look at our capability. We are doing 100 billion of R&D exports from this country. And we still do not make products in India. It's a disaster. So about 10, 15 years ago, a group in Bangalore got together called iSpirit. And they said that we should become a software product country. And so last, last 10 years, we've become a software product country. We've created DPI. DPI, UPI, etc. Our India stack is the best world-class software products that you have today. Similarly, companies like Zoho, which is a billion-dollar software company, has come out of India. So, HCL itself today is the largest software product company because HCL also took the decision five, six years ago to move from services to software products. So, HCL has a $1.4 billion software product company. It's called HCL Software. So, we need to move there. Reason? You look at what's happened to software also. Our margins used to be 50%. Today the margins are down to 25% or 20%. There are headwinds to software. What is what is Gen AI going to do to software services? Do you need programming anymore? No, sir. Yeah. Kitana large hamara programming capability has country ki overnight katam ho Do you need BPO anymore? No, sir. Everything is going to has headwinds today. All soft, all services have headwinds. So we have to. My vision and the vision of a few of us who work together on this is to create the next India. The next India should be an India as a product nation. So whether it's hardware, whether it is drones, whether it is space, you know, whether it's nuclear. All these areas, we need to be a product nation, not a service nation. The moment you become a product nation, your value added increases. Take an Apple product. Thousand dollars may be that. Okay? India ki value addition kya hai? I think so. Thirty dollars. Hum manufacture karte. Hum badi badi baatein karte hain ki haan, Apple manufacture karte. Boss, we have created scale, but we have not created value addition. So the next step for us after creating scale is to create value addition. If we do value addition and make products in India, then India will be recognized globally. And there is an opportunity today. Why is that opportunity? Because China has occupied that space for the last 30 years. They became a product country. Today, lot of Americans and Europeans don't want to buy from China. Because they don't like their policies. They don't want to be dependent on one country. Because when they were dependent on one country during COVID, they died. Everybody's supply chains were disturbed. So, everybody is looking at an alternative. What is that alternative? 
Who is that altogether? To China, India. Who else has engineering and design capability that we possess? Vietnam doesn't. Vietnam, in ten years, can you imagine, has gone from zero to hundred and twenty billion dollars worth of export of electronics. You know how much we do? Twenty billion. Is that what we should be doing? So my view is that we should have a vision as a country to be a product nation, and few of us are working. and we are going in trying to socialize this with the government and saying that we must become a product nation in everything we do then the value addition can be dramatic in our rough numbers that we have done for electronics see electronics today in india is a 200 billion business it's caught up with software for software is 250 everybody used to laugh about manufacturing and design and electronics 10 years ago all those people have stopped laughing about it because we are 200 billion you know what is our opportunity size in india for electronics by 2047 we can be a 4 trillion electronics country that's what we should do Uh, sir, uh, one of the thing is uh, which I hate about our students is uh, they don't. Uh, for example, I am doing mechanical or I am doing some electrical. Then too, I will go for some software job. So that is one of the reason I feel that uh, we don't have uh, that much engineers who can build product like uh, aircrafts or something like that. Because many people are changing their streams also. You see, they change their stream post their B Tech. Ninety nine percent of them. In America, in undergrad, you are allowed to change your stream in undergrad itself. You can go from engineering to science, science to music. This kind of flexibility is not there in the country. हम वो PCM पढ़ना तो हम PCM ही पढ़ते रहते हैं. So वो change करना पड़ेगा हमें एक undergrad program. दूसरी चीज़ ये है कि the attraction of software with salaries that were happening was phenomenal. So every engineer Their dream job was a software job. Nothing wrong with it, because it paid phenomenally. It played to their capabilities. An engineer is an analytical person, so any analytical person will then go do a damn good job in software. Okay, because they they have that inherent analytical capability. They have the they have the programming capability. Now suddenly, Gen AI is here. I think it will be very dicey for students to only look at software. They will have to become real engineers. And one of the things that is missing in our uh, education system is that not a single institute teaches you how to make a product. So yesterday I was very happy in IIT Kanpur to see a lot of startups who were making products for a change. दस साल पहले मैं यहां जब आया था तो सब लोग एप्स बना रहे थे एप्स एप्स क्या होता है दैट्स नॉट अ प्रोडक्ट कुछ मजा ही नहीं उसको आई थिंक यू मेक अ मेटेक प्रोडक्ट यू मेक अ वेंटिलेटर यू मेक अ प्रोडक्ट फॉर एग्री आई सो अ लॉट ऑफ दो सम फेलो एड अ सॉइल टेस्टिंग प्रोडक्ट अमेजिंग प्रोडक्ट ऑल हार्डवेयर प्रोडक्ट दैट इज वेयर इंजीनियर शुड बी इंजीनियर शुड बी doing engineering not software alone but i'm telling you the attraction of software will go away in the next 10 years and it's the time for us to do value addition in the country and utilize our engineering and r&d capability to become a leader in the world with products Mr. Yes, I personally think there is opportunity for India, and if mm. we can make Chandrayaan, we can make anything. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Okay, so uh, that's all for today. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for coming and sharing your learnings and insights. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Okay.